the last while this month we have been looking at take new ground in what relationships take new ground in relationships and we uh, in doing that we looked at various relationships but we said uh, first of all that from the scriptural standpoint uh -huh, from the scriptural standpoint is it battery I think so no or yes all right but from the scriptural standpoint we said God has given to us two main commandments the first one is what's the first one love God and love people love God and love people the Bible says it's all summed up in those two things whatever you do shout and prophesy and da, 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 whatever the Bible says it must be based on those two things your love for God and your love for people I'm gonna call our sister Messiah is gonna come and read our scripture for us today and we're reading from the book of Ephesians uh, chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 to verse 5 to 9 servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ not with eye service as men pleasers but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth the, the same shall he receive of the Lord whether he be bond or free and ye masters do the same things unto them forbearing threatening knowing that your master also is in heaven neither is there respect of persons with him praise the lord amen let's all stand as we pray father we give you praise amen this is your word this is your word your word comes with an anointing and god you've commissioned us to declare your word to your people and so today, God, we thank you for this Logos word. And as we declare it, we pray that that word will, God, fall on good ground. We declare that the ground on which it fall will be fertile. It will be receptive. That dear God, they will open and receive your word. And it will bring forth much fruit in every life today. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. We bless God. You may be seated. For all those of you who joined us on uh, Zoom today and on Facebook, welcome, welcome. It's so good to have you. i put your hands together. We have Sister Lydia Joseph in the house. Amen. God bless you, my sister. It's good to see you back out among the saints. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, we... We've been praying constantly, if you've been with us, uh, against COVID-19. Every prayer we pray, we take it on, full scale. And, and if, like me, you heard the announcements um, that the Prime Minister gave, I want you to give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on, don't take it light. Let's give praise. Amen. If you're on Facebook, you're on Zoom, put your hands together. Send some emotives and stuff. Come on, clap your hands. Amen. What, what kind of little thing is that? Hey. Jesus was very upset when people didn't say thanks. So we must always, always remember. Huh? Lady Maxman, you have to say thanks. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And so we thank God. Uh, from Monday, most of all, there is most of these restrictions are gone. We still have some going, and so we want to encourage you to keep those that are still there. Yes, and even though the restrictions are gone, 
you take the necessary precautions. They don't mean free up, free up, and do what you want. Yes? Amen? All right. We need to take care and do what is required. But on Monday also, from Monday, all public servants go back to work. Pastor, you're on your own with that one. <laughs> you're on your own with that one. <laughs> I'm not sure how many will be shouting and singing for that. Some of them like that fella there. Oh, Lord, have mercy. But the dictionary defines a work as an activity that requires that exerts strength, uh, the, your faculties to perform something. That's work. And another definition for it, which some have said, is an activity done to earn a livelihood. And a lot, a lot of persons have stuck on, on that one. And um, it's also said that work is an activity that... Uh, requires some function to be performed. But let me ask you a question. For those of you who are employed, how many of you really like your job? Huh? And how many today is Sunday? How many of you are looking forward with anxious, Sister Val, anxious anticipation? Monday are going to work. You're happy and you're rejoicing. You miss your fellow workers. I want to go to work. Eh? Let me. All right, don't oh, put up your hand. Don't rush all at the same time. If you answered yes, but I ain't seen anybody rushing to put up their hand. But if if you did, you are in the minority. A survey that was done in the U.S said, show that 65% of workers are unhappy with their jobs. Not sure what it is in Trinidad and Tobago. I haven't been able to get a total survey for Trinidad. But most of them who go to work, they do it based on the old, you know, the Sesame Street thing. I owe, I owe. So off the work I go. I owe, I owe. And uh, we're only going because we need the money. Yeah? And that's the idea. And I want to deal today very clearly as Christians what the word of God says. Because I think it has eaten into our system, into our psyche, and we have adopted a pattern of the world. And we need to understand what God's word says. And I want you to understand as we go to this whole issue of work, what does the Bible say as we deal with this relationship? In Genesis chapter 1, first book of the Bible, God did some work. And the scripture says in verse 31 that when God was finished working, he stepped back and he said it is very good. God made the heavens and the earth and he did all of that. And then when God was finished doing that, the Bible says, then God made man and put him in the garden. And, and, and just on a side, I think that is a good point for us guys. You notice, the first thing God do, he build house and provide, then he send, then he make man. So if you're going to find woman, get house first. Get place to put the woman. And all the women should say, Amen. let's be like God. Remember we start with Ephesians 6, 1 that says, be mimic, mimic God, imitators of God. And our God didn't put man and then say, oh gosh, let me find, look for a leaf. The Bible says he made the heavens and the earth, he provided and then, Daddy Ola, then he brought man in. So after God made man, the Bible says, 
Do you know the first thing God did after he made man was he gave man work. God assigned work to man. That was the first thing he did. The Bible says in Genesis 2.15, And the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden to work. That's in the scripture. The Lord God put him in the garden, and God put him in the garden to work. Everybody say, God gave man work. Yes, he did. Now, God put man to work, and the Bible says, while doing this work, and that is why, you know, ladies, sometimes you see men are so caught up. Work is fulfilling for men. Because God gave them to do it from the very beginning. And so work finds a fulfillment when man does it. When God gave man to work, then man needed some help. And God made woman. And the Bible says he is, he, he is his helper. Everybody say woman is a helper. Woman is a helper. I need any Hannah. Woman is a helper. So God made woman to help man. And you know, after blessing the both of them, God again renewed the assignment. He said, both of you go and work. Be fruitful. Multiply. Take the earth. And you know what it says? Subdue it. So you had to do. God didn't just say, sit down and it will come. God said to man, you take the earth and subdue it. Let the earth work for you. You put yourself to turn the earth. God said, work it. Everybody say, work is good. God made work. And it is interesting, Christians, to note, we're talking about work. God gave man work to do before the fall. Before sin entered the world. Come on, church. Sometimes we have this mentality, man sin, and so because of that, by the sweat of your brow, then you go earn bread. And if it wasn't for sin, we'd have been sleeping around all day like the lucky old son. But this happened before the fall. So work wasn't some punishment that God gave man. Yes? Work was part of God's plan to give man fulfillment before the fall. And so this issue of the world that somehow makes you think that work is some negative punishment is ungodly. It's a good place to say amen. If you don't want to say amen, just look on the ground. Because God made work. And that is why the scripture says in Romans 12, 1, do not be conformed to this world, to the pattern of its thinking. Change your mind. Because the child of God operates under a different system. Jesus himself, when he was here, he worked as a carpenter 30 years. Worked for the man. Before he started, and we are always careful to say before he started his public ministry, because we're coming to that. The Bible says, Paul, and Paul was what? A tent maker. And we don't talk work in the negative. Watch it, that is an ungodly thinking. So much so, that in 2 Thessalonians 3.1, you know what it says? If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. God so understands the importance of work. He says, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. For all the lazy sluggards around who think they're going to use the Bible to say that they're supposed to relax and work is a punishment, that is not of God. You hear me, church? God made work before sin entered the world. 
it was an interesting part of what man was supposed to be. Part of the issue that causes us to have this incorrect relationship with work is this thing we call the sacred and the secular. And I want to put that to death in this house and for all who are listening. Because this issue of the sacred and the secular keeps us in bondage. It's an Old Testament concept that we want to hold on to that is not there. We tend to divide everything into these two spheres. We said this is sacred and this is secular. So what I do in my work is sacred work and you are secular. And so when we are in church and we come to church, never mind, we spend most of our hours in, in what we call the secular work. But when we come to church, we're doing sacred things. And when we're out there, we tend to say that we're working in the secular. The Old Testament had that pattern. The Old Testament said, over here is sacred. These were sacred instruments. These were sacred chairs. Over there was secular. And never the two shall meet. That is how it operated in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus, in fact, you know, in the Old Testament, it was separate. People like me couldn't be priests. And that is why I thank God for the Old Testament. Because you couldn't have bow leg, bandy leg, while out of the running. And you had to be a certain height. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Freedom! So we're not holding on to Old Testament. Pastor Daniel, you and me both. No thing you play out to the running. We in it together. <laughs> but now, the New Testament says what? We are all priests unto God. Come on. We are all priests unto God in the, in the New Testament. The Bible says now, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in the, the Holy of Holies, but the Bible now says he dwells what? within us he is with us and so in the new testament wherever we go god is there and the concept this issue of this dividing line of sacred and secular doesn't work i remember when i got saved i was going to uh, what was then called duke street pentecostal it's now the Pentecostal Cathedral. And we had services in the Good Samaritan Hall, Duke Street in Portland. And that hall was rented by every and anybody for fed, party, all kinds of stuff. And every Saturday night almost there was a fete in the hall. And after fete, we had service on a Sunday morning. And you're going on the Sunday morning, they were supposed to clean it, but still we had to move a can of beer bottle, clean up this, throw away people's things, all kinds of stuff. Spray it a little bit, bring some perfume. And when we were finished, wow, Sunday morning, the presence of God moved like, you see, that place was filled and electrified with the power of God. But the night before was fed after fed after fed, rum for so till I die. What made the difference? It wasn't the place. It was what? The people. Because where you and I gather, that's the church. That's the church. And this issue of there it is, and that is sacred, and this is secular, is no longer so. Those walls have been broken. And so the issue of then, we move it and we categorize work, and we have some work as sacred work, and some work as secular work. Jesus spent that first 30 years doing carpentry because work was important. And while he was doing it, he was doing ministry. And that is why we say at 30 years he began his public ministry. It didn't just say that Jesus now start doing a ministry when he is 30. Everything you do impacts on someone else. 
And so your work, you can serve God wherever you are. You serve God in your work. The Daniel and those of you who are with us uh, in the book of Lamentations in our, in our study would know Daniel was one of those who was carried off. When they cleared out um, uh, uh, Israel, he was one of those that was carried out, taken captive and taken to uh, Babylon. Now Daniel is, finds himself in a totally pagan environment. He is no longer in the sacred. He is no longer among the people he knows. He is no longer about these Christians. He finds himself in a pagan environment. And at the time, King Nebuchadnezzar that took him, uh, gave him work to do, appointed him as a, a government bureaucrat. And it ain't nowadays that bureaucrats keep... Oh, um, that money does not find itself in the right place when you're in certain positions. It happened a long time. And so Daniel found himself that he could now fix the books and do what he wanted to do. In fact, we could justify it and say he was an ungodly ruler. And you know what we say in Trinidad, Daddy Ola? Teeth from teeth, this may God laugh. And so we justify ourselves in doing wrong if, if we're taking it from somebody who do wrong too. And as Christians, we need to get these things out of our psyche because you say it in jest, but it affects the way you live. It affects what your children do. It affects the society. And every time we hear it, we must come against it in the name of Jesus. We must speak life. And don't speak these things that are not of God. Teeth from teeth don't make God laugh at all. God hates evil by anybody. And so, Daniel could have used Trinidad mentality and started to get them. You see me? I only do me. I ain't working for them. Them's a pack of teeth. I'm not with them. But the Bible says Daniel worked in his government office, sitting behind his government desk, doing his government duties. And while doing that, he was able to serve God. He was able to minister. And the Bible says Daniel rose higher and higher among his country. So much so that when King Nebuchadnezzar died and the Babylonian empire started to waver and that empire was taken over by King Darius, they learned and knew about Daniel's work and Daniel was given an even higher position. He was appointed as one of the highest officials in the land. And I want you to remember, there came a time when pressure was put. And I'm just saying, oh, I just realized that is Miss Lenora there. And Maureen, well, look at that. Family in church for so today. Bless the Lord. Good to see you. Good to see you. Blessings. There was a time when pressure came on, on Daniel, doing his government work and being diligent. And they, as you know, they tried to make Daniel do things that was ungodly. They said, Daniel, you're going good, but stop praying to your God. And then Daniel said, hey, that's enough. Obedient are falling only all the way, but you see that and not in that. Because we must serve God and do what God says. And because that, you know, you know the story, Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. And in the lion's den, for doing what is right, God shut the lion's mouth. But what I want to tune in today, the Bible says in Daniel, in chapter 6 of Daniel, when the king now comes to the, to the, to the, um, to the lion's den the next day, after they thought Daniel was dead, this is what the king says. The Bible says, when he came near to the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Because even the king didn't want to do it. And the king says, Daniel, I <laughs> love it. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Isn't that interesting? Daniel worked in a pagan environment. He worked in a pagan office. He worked around pagan people, a pagan king. 
And yet the one thing that this pagan king knew is that Daniel served God continually. Huh? What about you? In the office you work, huh? in the place that you work, can they say that one thing we know, that person has served God continually. They may try to do you what, but they say, see that person, they know their God. They are Christian. They are serving God. In all that they try to do because of Daniel's testimony while at work. Because Daniel understood that he had to serve God in his work. We are all involved in ministry. And your work is ministry. I worked as a senior executive in many organizations. And, and, and sometimes person says before I became a full-time pastor. And persons will sometimes say to me, and I always correct them, they say, Oh, you're in ministry now? And I say, so what was doing me for? It's because of this, this ungodly, sacred, secular divide that somehow they feel, huh, Junior, that you're working in ministry. So i in ministry and what are you doing? you making money. That is not ministry. Get that out of your head. It's ungodly. Whatever you're doing, the Bible said that is ministry. I was in ministry just as much then as I am now. Come on. The nature of it will change. God will call some of you all to go into, to, be, to be missionaries, to become evangelists, to be pastors. You will get into full time doing other things. And who you're able to reach and what you're able to do will change. But it's ministry. Wherever you are, you're in ministry. God's calling upon us to reach. God has called us to work. Work is of God. And in your work, God says, you must be able to minister. Wherever you are, you must be able to reach people for the cause of Christ. Because we're all involved in ministry. Sometimes you find yourself in a job that's not your job. And sometimes when I tell people about um, ministering in their work, they say, yeah, people who, you know, in real work and thing. But you see me, Pastor, I only hear going on, I ain't get nothing else to do. Eh? And I only hear because I need to get some money. So when I get the real job, then I will do it. And I say to them all the time, you remember Daniel? Daniel didn't say, um, apply for a, a, a application to go to Babylon, you know. The man was taken there as a slave against his will. Come on, church. The man had no choice. He could have sit down and moan and cry and do nothing. But you know what Daniel does? He gets up and he works diligently that people start to recognize in a pagan place his captors have to realize that his God is in charge. And God is calling all of us to do that, to be that kind of person, because yes, you, you know, in 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 um, in Jeremiah, and for those of you again who are with us in our in our Bible study, would by now you're with us in terms of the whole historical move of the people of Israel, what happened to them in Israel, taken captive in Babylon. But you know, before they went, the prophet Jeremiah spoke to them, and the prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 29 and verse 5. He says, when you go, this is before he had prophesied that they would go, that God would, that they would be taken captive. And Jeremiah says to them, when you go, you must build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat. Eat what they produce. Marry. Have daughters and sons. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have... Uh, there's the Bible. This is slaves, you know. You take me against my will. Eh? All of us have that 
that ancestral experience. We Africans, we Indians, we come here. Huh? And, and Jeremiah says, when you go there, forced labor, it's not when you decide I'm going to take a vacation. But he says, when you find yourself there, you must what? Seek the peace and prosperity of the city that I have carried you into exile. He says, pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you will prosper too. Come on church. We are all exiles. Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're just here for a while. And God is calling on each of us. While we are here. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. Because the night cometh when no man can work. And while I am here. The Bible says I will work diligently. Everything I do. I do it as unto the Lord. Not unto Caesar. Caesar is just the man we're seeing there. But God says I do it as unto the Lord. Ah, Minister Valerie with joy. My son came one time. And he was telling me, Daddy, these people giving me um, overwork. I was hired to do this, and they want me to do this, that, and those. And I said to him, son, how many hours do you work? I said, can you do this, that, and those in the eight? He says, yes, but with a lot of pressure. I said, pressure do kill. Pressure is only bus by. And I said to him, you may not realize it, but they're doing you a good. Because while they hire you for only this, you're getting experience in that, these, and those. And one day, you will take all of that, leave them, and go somewhere higher. And he was able to experience that. Because wherever you go, God is calling upon us to be diligent. And I want to say to us, as Christians, in closing, dealing with work, that portion we read gives us some keys. It says, one, don't brag. When you at work, God is saying, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. You go to work and you're talking a certain thing. You see me? I don't have to work here, you know. They better watch what they're telling me because I go put them in the place. Huh? Watch your mouth. The Bible says, obey, come on, obey your masters diligently without murmuring. Don't brag. Secondly, don't nag. The Bible talks about that. You must work not giving eye service. You know something you do, but you're watching next door. Uh, uh, but he, uh, look at, he doing nothing. And look, he gave me a set of things. You know, what, he, what he doing? When he's I not in that, them gave me all the, the Bible says you don't watch no eye service. Whatever they do, they got to answer to God for themselves. Eight hours in a day, I do what I can within the time, diligently as unto the Lord. And I say good evening when it's done. The third thing is don't lag. Don't brag. Don't nag. And don't lag. Don't be lazy. My son came uh, yesterday by and he showed me some pictures of people on, the, on, the, on his job. They have cameras take pictures of them. During work, they sleep in. They hide all kind of thing underneath and they lie down sleeping on a ledge. They may be sleeping on a little thing. During work hours. As the child of God, God is calling you to a higher thing. Don't say it in here. This goes stand as a testimony against all of you all. Oops, so you come to church today. Mm -mm. Because God is going to hold you accountable for this word, you know. It's not a jump and shout Holy Ghost word all the time. But God is going to hold you accountable for this word that you've heard. Because on your job, God is saying, don't lag. It is important for us as a child of God not to be lazy. Colossians says, so whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord with all your heart. 
And then I say, finally, don't sag. Because sometimes on the job, we can be inconsistent. We start off good, and then quietly in the job, we fall in line to the people of the world. And we join in with them. The person goes in, and you know you're supposed to do, I'm um, 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 four, and they say, eh, eh, I'm wrong here. We ain't doing that, we're doing two. And you have to decide what you will do as a Christian. They'll go in there and you start to live right and suddenly you're not in it. But then they start talking the bad jokes, making the talks. And little by little, you join in it. And you laugh and give, give, give too. When they do it. And you're starting to duck in, duck out. And suddenly there's no difference between you and them. And so... Don't sad. Let's bow our heads. Today, we are focused on the relationship we have in work. And God is saying to each of us, yes, as a Christian, there is a way we work. And our work is a testimony of our Christianity. It pains my heart anytime I hear somebody say, I have some work to do, but don't, don't bring no Christian for me. I don't want them. You know, long ago, people used to only want Christian workers. Because we're supposed to have a... We do it as unto the Lord. He is the one we're working for. He will see that you get success. He will advance you. He will repay you. This morning, if you're here, if you're online, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to extend an invitation to you. But first of all, you need to dedicate your life to him. That Christ died for your sins. And he wants the best for your life. And the struggles that you might be going through at work or where you are, with Christ in your life, he will give you the victory to overcome. He will elevate you. He will open new doors and take you out of those areas that you should not be. He is going to put you in places that you never thought you could reach. Because you're dedicated to him. Father, we pray today for everyone listening to us. And God, some who may be going through some trying times on their jobs. And some who've had the wrong attitude to work. Their relationship with the job itself and even with the others on the job has not been in keeping with your word. But today, we're going to take new ground. We're taking new ground in this relationship with work. God, remove that line of secular sacred. And may we see that everything we do is as unto the Lord. We're not doing it for this master here, but we're doing it for you. Because you said while we are here, we need to occupy with excellence. That your name will be glorified and through what we do. They may think they're taking advantage, but we're serving a bigger God. And so I pray today that every Christian will rise to the challenge. And they will be the people you've called us to be. God, raise up some Daniels among us. Some Daniels who in the face of, of really harsh situations, they will serve you and they'll bow their heads and pray and say, God, give me the strength to deal with the things I've got to deal with on this job. Give me the strength, God, to rise, to be the person you've called me to be. God, so that through my life, others would look and see and say, wow, there is a God. I can see him working in you through your life. Bless your people, God. Elevate them. Let promotions come. Let new opportunities come. Bless everything they put their hands to do as they obey your word. Not in slothfulness. Not in talk and no action. But in being the people you've called us to be. And so, let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen.